What if crossing from Luzon to the Visayas felt no different than driving from Manila to Batangas? No ferry queues. No weather delays. No waiting six hours to move 90 minutes across water. For millions of Filipinos, that question is not abstract, it is personal. Every Christmas rush at Matnog, every stranded trucker watching cargo rot in line, every family stuck on asphalt while the sea decides their fate, exposes a hard truth. In a modern economy, water gaps without fixed links are no longer neutral geography. They are bottlenecks. Today, Luzon Visayas connectivity still hinges on roll-on, roll-off ferries crossing the San Bernardino Strait. On paper, the crossing takes about 90 minutes. In reality, it is one of the most fragile logistical choke points in the country. Weather shuts it down, demand overwhelms it. Peak seasons paralyze it. During recent holiday surges, vehicle backlogs stretched for kilometers, turning highways into parking lots and time into economic loss. The issue is not mismanagement, it is scale. Ro-ro systems are flexible, but flexibility breaks when demand becomes structural rather than seasonal. Other countries faced this same moment and made a choice. Japan, another island nation battered by weather and terrain, did not rely indefinitely on ferries to connect Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. It built fixed links. Denmark bridged islands that once depended entirely on ships. China stitched together its coastal archipelagos with tunnels and sea bridges, not because ferries failed, but because ferries could never fully carry a modern economy. The lesson is consistent. Once traffic reaches a certain threshold, mobility becomes infrastructure bound, not service bound. The Philippines has reached that threshold. Domestic logistics costs here remain significantly higher than regional peers, not due to distance, but due to discontinuity. Every forced stop, every port queue, weather delay, and vessel shortage compounds into higher food prices, slower industrial growth, and widening regional inequality. Economists have long warned that archipelagic states without fixed links pay a hidden tax on every shipment. Over time, that tax erodes competitiveness, investment confidence, and inclusive growth. This is why a Luzon Visayas fixed link is no longer a prestige project or a futuristic ambition. It is the same kind of structural intervention Metro Manila needed before it committed to a subway system. The logic is identical. When surface solutions saturate, underground or undersea, solutions become inevitable. A fixed link would not replace ferries. It would stabilize the system around them. It would transform an unpredictable crossing into a continuous corridor, turning geography from a constraint into an asset. At its core, this is not about engineering bravado. It is about national integration. In an archipelago, connectivity is destiny. And the longer the country waits to close its most critical internal gap, the more that gap quietly taxes growth, resilience, and opportunity. One delayed crossing at a time. At its heart, the Luzon Visayas fixed link is built around one simple but powerful idea. The sea should no longer decide when the country moves. The proposal envisions a permanent, weather-resilient land connection spanning roughly 28 kilometers across the San Bernardino Strait, a stretch of water long respected by sailors for its strength, but feared by logistics planners for the same reason. Whether realized as a long-span bridge system, an undersea tunnel, or a hybrid of both, the goal is constant and clear. Uninterrupted, 24 by 7, year-round movement of people, vehicles, and goods between Luzon and the Visayas. From an engineering standpoint, the options are deliberately flexible, not indecisive. A suspension or multi-tower cable-stayed bridge would turn the strait into a visible symbol of national integration. An undersea tunnel, bored or immersed, would remove weather risk entirely, insulating traffic from typhoons, waves, and surface currents. A hybrid bridge tunnel system, now considered global best practice in difficult waters, allows designers to adapt to depth, seabed conditions, and high-velocity currents without forcing a single solution across the entire crossing. As one international infrastructure consultant once put it, megaprojects succeed when design follows geography, not ego. The ambition behind this vision is not speculative. The Philippines would not be entering uncharted territory. It would be joining a proven global club. China's Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge stretches 55 kilometers across open sea combining bridges and tunnels to withstand typhoons and heavy shipping traffic while carrying more than 150,000 vehicles per day at peak. 
Japan's Akashi Kaikyo Bridge, with a main span of nearly 2 kilometers, was designed to survive magnitude 8 earthquakes and winds exceeding 280 kilometers per hour. Standards remarkably similar to what the San Bernardino Strait demands. These projects were once dismissed as too bold until they were built. Today, they are treated as essential national arteries. What makes the Luzon-Visayas link especially significant is that it must be designed not just for normal conditions, but for extremes. Engineers would plan for magnitude 8 seismic events, super typhoon wind loads exceeding 300 kilometers per hour, and some of the strongest tidal currents in the Philippine archipelago. According to global infrastructure insurers, climate-resilient design now adds 10 to 15 percent to upfront costs, but reduces lifetime disruption and economic losses by multiples of that amount. In human terms, that means fewer stranded families, fewer spoiled goods, and fewer moments when an entire region waits helplessly for the weather to pass. This is why the project is more than concrete and steel. It is a national confidence play. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe once described major connectivity projects as bridges of resolve, signals that a country believes its future is worth building for. In the Philippine context, a fixed Luzon-Visayas link would say something similar, that geography will no longer dictate inequality, that resilience is a design requirement, and that Philippine engineering belongs in the same conversation as the world's most demanding megaprojects. In the end, the real measure of success is not the length of the span or the depth of the tunnel. It is the quiet normalcy it creates when crossing between Luzon and the Visayas becomes unremarkable, routine, and reliable. When movement is no longer an event, but a given. That is the true vision behind the fixed link. Not spectacle, but permanence. At the center of the Luzon Visayas fixed link vision is a route that feels almost inevitable once you look at the map. Matnog in southern Luzon to Allen in northern Samar. For generations, this narrow stretch across the San Bernardino Strait has been the country's logistical hinge point, where buses stop, trucks line up, and time slows down. From a planning perspective, the alignment is not just familiar, it is strategic. It shortens distance, avoids unnecessary detours, and concentrates intervention where demand is already proven, rather than forcing traffic to discover a new corridor. Crucially, the proposed alignment is being optimized with restraint, not brute force. Engineers are prioritizing routes that minimize disturbance to sensitive marine ecosystems, steer clear of major international shipping lanes, and take advantage of comparatively stable seabed conditions identified in preliminary survey. This matters because modern megaprojects are no longer judged only by whether they can be built, but by whether they can coexist. As one Asian Development Bank infrastructure brief bluntly states, projects that ignore environmental and navigational realities do not fail immediately, they fail politically and socially over time. From an engineering standpoint, the strait demands respect. Currents here can be fierce, depths plunge dramatically, and the seabed varies across short distances. That is why advanced hydrodynamic modeling, used today in projects like cross-sea tunnels in Scandinavia and East Asia, is central to the design philosophy. Deep water foundations, potentially reaching 70 to 90 meters in certain sections, would be required to resist scour, seismic movement, and long-term fatigue. These are not experimental techniques. They are the same methods now standard in offshore wind farms and long-span sea crossings worldwide. Environmental integration is being framed as a core design pillar, not a compliance afterthought. A full environmental impact assessment would explicitly address marine biodiversity, fisheries livelihoods, and coastal sediment flow, issues that directly affect communities, not just habitats. Studies from comparable projects show that early integration of fisheries data and sediment modeling can reduce long-term environmental disruption by as much as 40%. In plain terms, that means fewer unintended consequences for fishermen whose livelihoods already depend on a delicate balance between land and sea. To manage both risk and ambition, the project is structured as a phased development rather than a single leap. In terms of scale and financing, expectations are deliberately sober. The cost is projected in the multi-hundred billion peso range, an order of magnitude comparable to the Metro Manila subway. That comparison is not rhetorical, it is instructive. 
The subway proved that the Philippines can absorb, manage, and execute infrastructure of this complexity when governance, financing, and technical discipline align. The fixed link would likely follow a foreign-assisted project framework, drawing on institutions such as JICA or the Asian Development Bank, possibly blended with a public-private partnership structure to spread risk and attract long-term capital. Ultimately, this framework is about credibility. It signals that the Luzon-Visayas fixed link is not a political announcement chasing headlines, but a disciplined national undertaking, one designed to endure storms, scrutiny, and decades of use. In that sense, the framework itself is already doing part of the work, turning a bold idea into a governable reality. Big infrastructure succeeds not because it is bold, but because it is boring in the right ways. The Philippines does not have to guess how to build something as complex as a Luzon-Visayas fixed link. It has already done it, quietly, slowly, and under intense scrutiny. The clearest modern example is the Metro Manila subway. At 33 kilometers underground with 17 stations and a price tag exceeding 355 billion pesos, the subway is the most complex civil engineering project in Philippine history. What makes it relevant is not its size, but its governance. Financing through Japanese ODA imposed milestone-based disbursements that forced discipline. Independent technical oversight insulated design decisions from political cycles. Most importantly, continuity across administrations proved more valuable than speed. As one Japanese project advisor noted during early construction phases, mega projects fail when urgency overrides sequencing. That same governance DNA, slow, strict, and globally supervised, is exactly what a Luzon Visayas fixed link would require. Not acceleration, not shortcuts, just consistency. An older but equally instructive case is the Marcelo Fernand Bridge in Cebu. Completed in 1999 with Japanese ODA support, the 1.2-kilometer cable-stayed bridge permanently altered the relationship between Cebu and Mactan. Before it, access to the international airport was time-uncertain and congestion-prone. After it, travel times dropped by more than 40%, and something subtler happened. Land values shifted. Tourism clustered. Secondary urban development followed the concrete. The bridge did not just move vehicles, it reorganized economic geography. That lesson matters. Fixed marine crossings rarely deliver linear benefits. They create multipliers, new investment zones, labor mobility, and spatial integration that ferries can never replicate. For trade and logistics, the impact would be immediate and measurable. Ferry queuing, weather downtime, and vessel shortages would no longer dictate schedules. Trucking firms could plan to the minute rather than the day. Just-in-time freight, currently risky across island gaps, would become routine. The most critical gain is predictability. Studies consistently show that reducing transit variability matters more to supply chains than reducing raw distance. In this case, variability drops from hours or days to minutes. Investment patterns would follow. A fixed link would unlock long underdeveloped growth zones in eastern Visayas, allowing manufacturers, logistics parks, and agro-industrial hubs to operate as part of a contiguous market rather than a peripheral one. Tourism, too, would shift structurally. Integrated circuits linking Bicol, Samar, and Leyte become viable not just for backpackers, but for mass and premium travel segments. The experience of the Orison Bridge is instructive. Within a decade of completion, the connected region saw an estimated 10% increase in combined regional GDP, not because of toll revenue, but because labor and capital could finally move freely. Social effects are just as consequential. Faster crossings mean faster disaster response and medical evacuation. Labor markets expand naturally as commuting boundaries widen. During construction alone, tens of thousands of skilled and semi-skilled jobs would be created, followed by long-term operations and maintenance employment. In an archipelago, mobility is not convenience, it is opportunity. None of this is without risk. Capital intensity demands financing discipline over decades, not election cycles. Environmental sensitivity requires global standard mitigation, especially for fisheries and coastal systems. Engineering complexity! 
Deep water, high currents, seismic exposure means there is no margin for improvisation. These risks do not argue against the project. They argue for doing it properly or not at all. That is why governance is the real project. Financing must anchor on a foreign-assisted project structure, with ODA loans providing stability and credibility. Select public-private partnership components, particularly in operations and maintenance, can be layered in, but only after the core risk is secured. Institutionally, a dedicated national fixed link authority would be essential. Coordinating the Department of Transportation, DPWH, NIDA, foreign partners, and civil society observers. Transparency is not a slogan here, it is the survival mechanism. Every major Philippine mega project that failed did so not because it was too ambitious, but because oversight fractured. Beyond the first span, the implications are long-term. A Luzon-Visayas link would anchor the Philippine Transport Master Plan and establish a template for future inter-island connections. Technologically, it opens the door to real-time structural health monitoring, climate adaptive design, and even integrated renewable energy systems such as solar or tidal supplementation. These are no longer experimental ideas. They are standard features in 21st century infrastructure. At its core, a Luzon-Visayas fixed link addresses the Philippines' most persistent structural weakness, unreliable inter-island connectivity. The country already knows how to execute projects of this scale, as proven by the Metro Manila subway and the Marcelo Fernand Bridge. The lesson is clear. Discipline beats drama, governance beats speed, and global standards beat improvisation. If executed with the same rigor, this project would not just connect islands. It would signal the Philippines' transition from fragmented geography to true archipelagic integration, economically, socially, and strategically, for generations to come.